Anything first responder-ish since I got out of high school is all I ever did. I'm super passionate about this industry. I'm very passionate about keeping people safe. We have another episode of 1075 Chatter. This week, we're going to our former employee, the national sales manager for the fire and EMS projects for Sound Off Signal. You want to tell us a little bit more about yourself and your background? Yeah, so um, I come from a, a town called Town of Chictawaga. I know you always struggle with that word. Not uh, anymore. It's on the, uh, the border of the city of Buffalo and um, born and raised there. Um, right after high school, got into the fire service, which led me into so many things that brings me to where I am today. Um, you know, it was one of those things I always wanted to do as a kid growing up. It was so cool to see all the trucks and everything going by and, um, got in right at 18, worked my way up through the ranks. Um, you know, was assistant chief for, I think seven, eight years. Then I did a year as a chief and then I ran for, uh, the district commissioner, one of the district commissioners. So, um, my current role, my current career, um, is working with Sound Off Signal. We manufacture emergency warning lights, and I'm their national fire manager. So I, I get the the awesome task of working between dealerships, end users, and OEMs to get our product on their apparatus, and I love it. And you were basically the on the forefront of them releasing the fire truck style lights and stuff like that. And you were basically, you know, behind meeting all these dealers and these manufacturers and you know, selling the product, showing the end user what yeah. you guys can do differently and, yeah. and getting that product. So, so when I started, I've been with Sound Off six years now. When I started with them, I started as their New York, New Jersey um, district manager. And the fire product was already in the works. Um, it was going to be released. So they were looking for someone to kind of, um, to handle that role and grow a market that we had zero market in or grow that market we had zero share in. Um, so, you know, I put my hat in the ring for it. And, uh, you know, it is, you know, fire apparatus is something I'm super passionate about. You know, when I got out of high school, one of the things I worked at American La France, so working on fire apparatus, and we did the prep work and things like that. Um, it was something I always kind of nerded out about. Um, so when this opportunity came up, kind of talked with them about it, threw my, my name in for it. And like I said, they already had the product um, being worked on. But when I was lucky enough to get in that position, we grew it from the ground up. And um, right at launch, COVID happened. So we had two years of not being on the road and pushing the product. There was no FDICs. Uh, we grew everything organically. We did it from behind my desk. We had no travel going on like much of everybody else. Um, so fast forward a few years later here now, um, we're a pretty good contender in the fire service now. Um, we, show, we have shown very well at the FDIC shows. Um, we won two years in a row of the EMS World Innovation Award by showing off our product. Um, so... Yeah, that's currently what I'm doing. What are some of the most memorable experiences you've had while serving as the chief in the fire service of your department? So like anybody, you were there. Uh, there's always good and bad. And, um, you know, you have your typical EMS, your rescue calls, your fire calls. Uh, one of the things that's been memorable for us, um, storms. Snowstorms? Yeah, like we had to learn how to adapt. You know, we get storm, we get snow, something called snow in Buffalo. And um, we've had to adapt throughout the years. And when a First started getting really bad. Um, I was maybe a lieutenant. Um, we had a, we we weren't prepared for it. We couldn't get members to the station. We didn't have the equipment to fight fires or respond in it. Um, so over the years, we kind of adapted and um, got really proficient at what we need to be fire department. <coughs> excuse me, during storms because when Buffalo gets hit, we get hit and we're we're down. We can't get people to the station. There's whiteout. There's no food. There's no power. And, um, you know, we went from getting our first piece of equipment was a, an Argo, a six wheel vehicle. And we got that with intentions, just getting manpower to the, to the station and helping the police get manpower to their station. Um, so those experiences have been pretty memorable on what we've done and where we've gotten now with the equipment we have for storms. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of others, memorable ones that, um, you know, a lot of saves throughout our career. Snow and Buffalo, right? Snow and Buffalo. Who would have thought? Everything else is the typical, uh, you know, fire rescue EMS, but the snow is definitely the most memorable. How would you say that your time with 1075 shaped your career and your professional outlook? Obviously when we started, you know, it was just all on-site mobile yeah. Until you If until you think you about it, when, and I love telling the story because when we started, I was obviously living at home. This was back in our much younger days. Right. You know, you and Larry took a, uh, my father 
took a chance on me. Um, you know, I proposed something to you that I, th I thought could work in Buffalo. There was nothing out there. I think there was maybe one other upfitter at the time. And you guys took a chance on me. And we, again, we grew that from the ground up. We had no representation there. I was pretty much doing it out of the basement of my mother's house. We had another guy, and we would go on site and build police cars till 2 in the morning. And then um, we, you know, it went from like one vehicle a month to two vehicles a week. And it just, you know, got busier and busier. And then, um, you know, conned you guys into letting me put a building up there. And, you know, that experience with growing a market that was, you know, again, a new name up there and building a brand and sound off was not heard of out there. Um, it has helped me, you know, have that drive and that work ethic that I, you know, most people don't have or some people didn't have. Um, so that experience, building a, a new business in the area, taking the pride in the business and all that has led me to, I think, great things that happened in my life um, and put me at where I'm at today, obviously. Stepping stone. Stepping stones. What I really like, too, is like before we got into uh, the fire market, the fire product line was kind of stagnant. It was like the same old stuff that's been around for the last 20, 30 years. There really was no innovation. Um, it was all single color. Nine, nine by seven was nine by seven, six by four, six by four, and that was it. Uh, one of the things that I've loved about Sound Off is the innovation. Um, so first off, like the easy part is the silicone, the M Power line of lights. It's a silicone light that um, was de developed for Sound Off. Very successful with it on the police market, and then we launched that into the fire sizes. So um, that's one key innovation part. Like it, it's guaranteed never to fade, crack, or discolor. First off. Um, it holds up to all the abuse in our daily jobs that firefighters do. You know, if you give a firefighter, they'll break it, right? But this could take abuse, hose couplings, tools, boots, trees, whatever you throw at it. It's really going to hold up to that abuse. Nothing out there right now. It's got a higher heat point, so it can take, you know, higher heat. It, and it works very well in low temperature conditions as well. Oh, so that's one thing. Um, the industry is moving towards connected trucks, you know, and sound off can help you with that with some of the products we have out there as well as other brands as well. Um, so I see the connected trucks, <coughs> excuse me, being a part of the future of fire apparatus. Uh, multicolor technology is a big trend right now. Okay. Uh, not too many people are doing anything with multicolors. So now you can have a warning scene and directional on one light head. So that's been pretty good. And then the solar patterns, you know, everybody was all crazy on the faster, the better and the brighter, the better. Us and along as other brands, you know, we're promoting a safer environment by giving slower patterns, automatic dimming, uh, just things like that to really increase worker safety. One of the things that I think that I haven't seen with other people, obviously because I was working with it this morning, um, was the brake tail turn lights with the warning override in them. I don't think there's another product like that in the industry on the... Yeah, and that's uh, that's something we, we were very happy to show off and um, because there isn't. We don't believe there is either, and that's been really well because um, now you can eliminate a quad cluster of lights, and you can bring down the price maybe a little bit on some some refurbs or new builds, and you can have a backup and warning all in one. So it's it's really cool and different. What we pump out today can be outdated in a month or two, but from when I started, a hundred times better. You know, again going towards a connected truck. Um, everybody's looking at the telematics now. Everybody wants vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle synchronization. Um, you didn't have that stuff years ago. Faster is not always better. It's just very distracting and oncoming motorists. It gets very bright at night. We can offer a calm scene now with slowing down the patterns, the automatic dimming again. I think the faster part of it, I think, was more of when the stuff first came out when it wasn't necessarily as bright as the strobes were and people were looking for that eye-catching pop. Yeah, I think that's. I, I was one of those faster. guilty parties. The faster, the better. Yeah. It was it was the cool factor, right? Right. Um, synced lights, like not even vehicle to vehicle synchronization. There's so many builders out there that don't sync the lights up, and that drives well, me nuts. And it was a a, a a product issue where the synchronization capabilities wasn't there unless you were flashing it through the the control yeah. system. What's really cool really about wasn't. what we offer is. Um, you know, there's a built-in sync wire, so there's no need for an external flasher ever. And you can sync, I don't know, like 26 to 30 lights on one sync wire. So, again, uh, just something more we provided for the customer to, to provide us a safer scene and a safer response. 
with some of those items. It's about improving, increasing driver awareness. And really, it's a communications tool. It's sending a clear message. Now, when you have civilians driving by and they see six or more vehicles on scene, there's a clear message that all the arrows are going to the left, or there's a clear message that you could see a slow pattern of each car going up and that there's not, there's multiple flash patterns and things like that. And that passing motorist may not know if there's anybody standing near there or what direction they're trying to get people to go. It's all about communication with the synchronization. And that's what we're really promoting from sound off is this is a communication device. I think they said it in one of the, one of when some of the, they were talking about the newer techs that we have that aren't familiar with the emergency services side where they don't necessarily take notice to the fact that the lights are synchronized, but it's more or less like a, an unconsciousness that there's, it's not so distracting to them. They're not necessarily stopping going, oh, look, all the lights are synced. It's just more or less like, okay, I can kind of see better exactly, and identify what's kind of going on. And I'm not just kind of like the the fly to the, the bugs. The, the moth, yeah. yeah. And, and it really is effective during, you know, heavy rainfall, snowfall, things like that. That's where it really comes key. Yeah, because that messes up everything because we tell that people all the time when they come in with, you know, with trying to get a, a interior light bar to fit something that's not meant for it. Yeah. So like the same thing is where you're getting all that reflectiveness and stuff like yeah. that where the worst times for it is when it's <clears> raining <throat> and when it's snowing out and that's when you're going to hate it. Yeah, and this has taken off very well on the police side of things. Um, it's starting to really take off in DPWs through municipalities. We work with many cities. You know, we were kind of doing a sync the city tour for the while or sync the county. And we work with many agencies that have their DPW, their fire police, and some tow that are all synced together. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's definitely the way this, this is headed. Um, what's cool about ours is it's just a little antenna that goes, goes on your dashboard. I think it's all about the vehicle connection, the, connect, the cloud-based programs and the cloud-based um, telematics and things like that. Uh, again, those things, those are things that are relevant in the law enforcement side of things today and the public work side of things today. You know, your plow trucks, things like that, all have this stuff. Um, I see fire apparatus and ambulances going towards us because fleet managers are going to want to know this information. Um, we're, we're, we're just going to be an information and data driven society. So, um, no other trends I really know of or see on the forefront right now. You know, the green is starting to really take it off. Right, which we yeah. saw in Connecticut. We just took a road trip up yep. there. You know, it was starting to really get popular with the DPWs, amber green for, for snow plows. You know, Michigan, New York. I don't know if New Jersey does, but there's a bunch of states that the green, you know, is more visible yep. during a whiteout condition. So you're starting to see that in the fire apparatus now. Uh, NFPA did um, allow green as a response color now. You know, as long as your state is okay with that. But, um, you know, Michigan, a lot of departments are using red-green for response. And going back to the green and the DPW stuff, if I remember correctly, you were part of trying to help change the legislation in New York, or was that another state? That no, no, that was New York. Um, so that was something I was very prideful in and got to work with a lot of state assembly and legislators on getting this approved. Um, you know, it started out with my local town. Uh, working with some friends in the highway department there, and I said, uh, hey, you got to take a look at this. This has been something that's going on in other states for a while now. And um, I had a lot of connections with uh, politics in our in our area. And, um, you know, a lot of state assembly uh, persons helped me um, get it as a bill written and taken to the governor's office. And it took roughly about a year and a half, two years. Um, but, you know, New York is uh, eligible to use that now. So maybe the next step I'll be working on it for emergency response. What leadership lessons did you learn from your time as a fire chief that uh, you apply to your current role? Um, treat everybody with respect. You know, I was never one of those guys for throwing down the, the fist and this is my way or, or nothing. Um, I want to hear everybody's opinion. I want to treat everybody with respect. I want them to treat others with the same. Um, Try to understand the situation and yeah. Yeah. make your own informed decision. You know, it's helped me. Uh, there's so many factors to it because there's, you know, so dealing with different personalities. It was dealing like, with different personalities, and it's dealing. You know, it's a high school essentially, um, so you become a teacher and a principal at the same time. Um, I don't know, but 
from organization to leading to all these things has just helped me progress to where I am in my career today. Because the first part is dealing yeah. with people. Yeah, absolutely. And learning how to, not necessarily I don't think working the people is correctly, but how to effectively manage people to get them to understand your point and kind of get them to work with you, not against you. Yeah, and I was lucky enough to have, you know, managing the shop in New York to have some of that experience as well. So, you know, you had to lead a team there as well. And I, you know, pretty much every job I've ever had, I I never stayed at, um, you know, I always worked my way up to some sort of leadership role, you know, whether I was still working on the ambulance or within the fire department or any of my jobs. So I've always been good with leading teams and hopefully uh, shaping them into the next round of leadership. And that's, uh, you know, something I accept the challenge to. What advice do you give to somebody looking to transition from a frontline emergency service role to a business or management position within the industry? So that's a tough one. Uh, You know, I got to a point where I didn't want to take people up and down the stairs anymore on the ambulance. And that's when I really started to bug you and Larry. Like, we got to get this going. So it's all all your personal – if you're going to do it, do it. Like, don't look back. Have no regrets. Um, work hard to get where you want to get. You can do it. You know, I'm a firm believer, and you can get what you want if you put your if you put the work in. So, um, if you're thinking of getting out of emergency service to get into something like this, you know, there's plenty of openings in the industry. This industry is looking for workers right now. Whether it's starting an install shop or running something, um, you know, one thing that sound office rate about is bringing on retired law enforcement, retired firefighters, you know, just because you're not in a sales role now per se doesn't mean um, you don't have the passion to work in an industry like that. So um, the advice is just do it. Just do it. Ask for help along the way. Get around, surround yourself with good people, surround yourself with a good company, and put the work in and it will pay off. You don't know unless you ask. You don't know unless you ask. And how many times did I ask? way too many times. <laughs> I still ask, right? You still ask. How do you balance the demands of a high pressure role in the emergency lighting industry with your personal life? And this I think is more a question for Jen than anything. Well, you know the boss. <laughs> and she told me not to name drop her, but yeah, the boss. Um, it's Even it's tough. And that was one of the reasons I only did a year as fire chief. You know, um, when I do something, I put my heart and soul into it. And I got to a point where I felt guilty that I couldn't you know, I'm traveling a lot. I'm the national manager, so I'm all over the country. I felt guilty to my membership that I couldn't always be there for drills or meetings or really have a day-to-day hands-on thing. Um, so I knew I had to take a step back because I had the same thing going on in the home front as well. And you're going to know this. The kids are going to grow up way too fast. And I blinked, and, you know, I got a high schooler and uh, – and, um, you know, going into third grade and it just went way too fast. So I had to make some decisions in my life. And, um, you know, Jen keeps me balanced too. You know, Jen keeps me focused. You know, when I'm feeling, uh, when I'm feeling down because I'm away for so long, you know, she reminds me of, you know, why we're doing what we're doing. And um, you, have to, you have to balance work life. There's no doubt about it. She gives you words of encouragement. Yeah. Yeah. You know, she, she says I do don't notice as much when you're not home as when you're home now. So I disrupt their lives when I'm back home, essentially. I'm making a mess. I know. It's things like that. So I guess things are going smooth when I'm gone. And when I come home, I just, you know. Getting the kids all riled up. And, exactly. Yeah. You know, I could get home at midnight and, you know, peeking in their rooms and getting them up and all that stuff. So, no, but it's super important to have a work-life balance. Okay. Um, I can't stress that enough. Um Make time for the birthday parties. Make time for, you know, don't leave on holidays. I was guilty of that for the first couple of years of this position. I left on Mother's Day. I missed birthday parties. And um, things will wait, right? So you got to balance that life out. I saw something the other day that said uh, you only have 18 Christmases or something like that with your kids. And to cherish all of it when you think about it. like And in, in hindsight, when you look back at it. And to make that's those cr- memories. Even, yeah, that's crazy to think. 18 holidays or, you know, 18 Mother's Days where they're growing up and they just go, you know, I guess it's one of those things where you, you like you said, you, 
you blink and they're gone. Yeah. So you have to cherish them when they're I there. I mean, I think Jen and I figured we probably have like 25 of those more in our house <laughs> between each kid. Poor Jen. The saint. She's a saint. She is a saint. She's a saint. Um, By the way, you're, um, I was told to bring home, home air fresheners. I don't think we have any. But she's still rocking it in her car. So she's holding on to that one. It's because she likes my face better than yours. True. <laughs> but she says hi, by the way. Of course she does. Yeah. Um, she wants to know when you and Larry are coming back up to Buffalo. She says it's been way too long. Did she actually say Larry? Not not in the winter. <laughs> I will preface that by saying not in the winter. When it was the, like it was like when the millennium, 98 last week. When the millennium opens back up again. I was going to bring it's that open. up. It's open. It's open again. Oh, is it? Yeah. Are you going to Have you, have you stayed there? It's open. It's refurbished. Do we, should we tell the story? or? You can tell the story. Feel so free. The story, so. I, was, I was going to come in and, and ask that question to you in a little bit. So okay. you might so, as well go there now. So this is a non-sponsored Millennium ad. Yeah, if you want, we, we do take corporate sponsorships. <laughs> and uh, if you want to make good on your uh, past horrible experiences, we'd love to stay there again. So there was, for free. For at free. the time, a really good, great hotel. I mean, I never had to stay there, but... It was like the to-do hotel in the area, and, you know, you guys would come up quite a bit for meetings. I think it was, like, one of the first ones after we got into our f- new lo- – was, was it the last location? One of the locations. The original location. Yeah, so um, we, I suggested we put you guys up in this hotel that was, you know, right by all the shopping, all this stuff. And um, a little to my knowledge, it was not up to par for the right, Rhino. Gabe, Gabe, Gabe booked, the, booked the reservation. Good, Gabe. Tell, we tell booked, the whole story. You booked the reservation. We booked the reservation. and uh, I did not book the reservation. And uh, my fellows got here, and it was just really bad, a really bad situation. There and the Google it, reviews on the way up. <laughs> I, 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 they had to be two hours away, and I was already getting threats from Larry because of the reviews <laughs> on, on that he was reading offline. And I'm like, no, no, no. It's You're, you're good, man. This is where everybody stays when they come in out of town. You're good. All the hockey teams come through. All the bands come through there. 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. He's not wrong. And um, I'll never forget, like, did you guys make it to your room? Two rooms. We went you you two went to rooms. two rooms. And, and they were by the pool, I yeah. think. And they were, and they were both so bad. No, the first room was by the pool. It had, it had so much mold in it, you could, I was, we were sneezing as soon as we walked in. Then she put us on the sixth floor. She went to the sick, we went up to the sixth floor. The room was as dark as could be. It had two lamps in the corner, and the floor looked like the original carpet from the 50s. So it was so bad. I remember this, and I, I still laugh at this. It was so bad when Larry went and complained. Like, the lady didn't even think twice about giving the, the refund we back. Like, we were like the fifth person. I was going to say, line. like, I remember like, you guys saying you guys like were like asking. the fourth one that day. Yeah. They are like, yeah, we got another one. We got another one. That's exactly what she said. We got another one that wants a so, refund. So since then, I guess that's been known as the hotel for – you know, not good things happening. The hourly rate motel, if you yeah, will. Yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of calls there and uh, fire in, please. So, um, and the but it, yeah, it, it is redone now, new management, new ownership. So I'd feel pretty good about putting you guys up in there again after you stay there first. It depends on what you're, it on what you're, you're putting it up. Can I get a second shot on that? <laughs> well, maybe. But what happens if it's not good? Well, you probably should you stay can't there. Fire me you should probably, you know, you can't fire you, but maybe I'll stay in your living room. <laughs> you know, you, know, you should probably maybe take Jen there for you know a night out on the town, and yeah, then, and then give your opinion. Yeah, you uh, guys can always stay in my basement. Oh, gee, yeah, I know. We've, we've heard about that's a we've that's a shout out basement. to Jason Meyer and yeah. Aaron, <laughs> who you know that's another story too. So I've been inviting these guys to my basement yeah, to, for, a long time. for nothing crazy. Just to, yeah, it has no, like we heard it has yeah, no it's windows. Just, uh, no, when no you're lights. in town, you stay at my place. Yeah. They've always laughed me, brush it off. Wouldn't you know, Aaron goes to Jason's dad's house and stays in his basement. In his basement. Yeah. Aaron's, but did, but Aaron's did, dead to me. Is, does Aaron, does Jason's father's basement have windows and <laughs> doors that you can open from both sides? Well, I don't know about that, <laughs> but love you guys both. So what keeps you motivated and passionate about this industry? So anything first responder-ish since I got out of high school is all I ever did. Again, American La France, um, the ambulance, um, you guys, a different outfitter before that, sound off signal. That's all I've ever really known. I'm super passionate about this industry. I'm very passionate about keeping people safe, getting home. You know, I've been there where we lost friends in this field. Um, 
you know, one of them was due to an accident. I've seen fellow employees um, have very close calls. This is something that's very important to me, um, just providing a safe environment for not only workers, but passing motorists and in the, the, the public. So those sort of things motivate me to make sure people come home at night. You know, obviously my family motivates me to want to do good and, and uh, you know, keep something like this going. So and you stay out of the house? I'm always out of the house. I am always out of the house. I'm a guest when I come home. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? Because we have, you know, three of them on this episode probably. <laughs> and they're all in the room. <laughs> They're all listening to it as it's being recorded. Those are our listeners. Um, About the fire service market um, and your career or the future of uh, the industry. You know, one one thing I would love to resonate is, you know, when you do spec out a a vehicle, and I'm not putting a plug on us or anything, when you do spec out your, your vehicle, you have options. You know, whether it's on, you know, generators or scene lights or warning lights or maybe not motors so much anymore, but... You know, so many people think whatever the dealer gives to you is your only option. Um, you're spending a million bucks, a million bucks plus. Ask for options. If, if, if there's other products out there that you're interested, you know, have that conversation with your, your dealership. Um, what did you say? You don't know until you ask. Um, just ask. And, you know, our team is here to, to help with some of that process, whether it's specifications or getting information. We have roughly 50 people throughout the U.S., the US. That can help with, you know, product training and product support and just, you know, sales calls, things like that. Um, you know, we are a young company. We're 30 years old, so we're babies in the industry. We have a lot to prove, but we're proving it as we move along here. Um, we're very rapidly moving up on the, the fire world and EMS world of specifications. Um, there's Everybody makes great stuff out there. We just want you to know you have another option. And maybe with the silicone, it's a little something different, something unique. And, um, you know, we can help you out with some very cool um, techniques with our blueprint system. Oh, I have a question. Where did you get those really, really cool socks that you're wearing? Because I got to get Ryan. Oh, I have them. I was actually going to. Oh, you have them? I have a pair. I I actually was going to. I wore them to give a shout out to Sheldon. Yeah. Sheldon gave me a pair for at FDIC. Is that where you got yours? Yeah. He was walking around and I forget what he gave them to me for. Sheldon? My man over at Tiger Tough Seats, thank you, buddy. I didn't get any because I, I had left early. You had left early. I, left I, early. I don't think anybody else got him that was in the booth, but he came over. I forgot what I was talking to him about. Sheldon's said, the I man. Think he still can I ask a question? When is Sound Off Signal going to give you socks to match? My first outfit? show was, I think it was PFE or PSE. They gave us socks. They were uh, gummy bears to, when we launched like Empower. So my kids wear them for like crazy sock day now. That's where they ended up, huh? So you want to talk more about the Millennium? Because I'm going to go stay there. But what, what's going to what's going to happen if I stay there and, and and you know I come up to visit and it's a dump like it was the last time? <laughs> you get to stay in his basement. Oh, that's, 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 yeah, that's. I would rather, rather drive the five and a half hours home than stay in your basement. Um, it's kind of I have not been in there, but it looks aesthetically nice from the outside. Are there less fire and EMS calls there and uh, police calls there? There's a lot more parties on a weekend now. No, that's just that, that's just yeah. that's just yeah. fantastic. Yeah, it's your it's your crowd. <laughs> older, older, older. You guys said older. No. Yeah. And and full disclosure, I am not Gabe's father, even though he calls me dad all the time. I think everybody believes it in the industry because every time I introduce you, it's my father. So. Whatever. Whatever works for you, Gabe. Uh, you know I love you guys. Unfortunately. We're glad you made it down here for this uh, for this interview. So. <laughs> I was actually here for something else. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's okay. You can, you can make, make us feel good. Come up for some buffalo wings, eh? Which is the place that we normally go that you like and they're well done? Um, Duffs? Was it Duffs or Anchor? It, was, it wasn't Anchor. It was, it was Duffs. Probably Duffs. It was Duffs. It was, yeah. it wasn't. That's usually the go-to when people come in. They want to go to Duffs or Anchor. There's a lot of good ones, though. Pubski. Yeah. Yeah, it was, there, right? it was one of the. Feel free for Anchor Bar, Duffs. Just just send us a donation now. We're out here plugging your stuff. I don't remember which was the one place, the last time that you and I ate there. I, it had to be Duffs then. Probably Duffs. Yeah. That was always the closest to the shop. Yeah. I went to a place with you that one night that I ate that mac and cheese cheeseburger. Oh yeah, that's uh. That Moody's. was you. Was that you and I? 
Mooney's. Mooney's. Yeah, you yes. guys always liked Mooney's. Yeah, Mooney's. Yeah, mac and cheese cheeseburger that was that big. It was. Oh. It was my my caloric intake for the week in one yeah. night. Yeah, yeah, one meal. Yeah, Buffalo's no short of terrible food. It's good food, but terrible for you. Terrible for you. Yeah. What about the beef on wick? You, you guys got yeah. those, yeah? The, the one the one day that you had us go and get beef on wick sandwiches. It cost for you two hundred bucks. Yeah, it was like two hundred dollars <laughs> for like ten sandwiches or something like that. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, worth it? No, no. Gabe, you never talked about in the first shop what you wanted to do though. You didn't tell everybody what you wanted to do in that first shop. You wanted to sell uniforms, equipment. Yeah, we tried that for a split second. You couldn't even sell a knife without without somebody coming in and asking twenty thousand questions and wasting your time. Yeah, yeah. I had you guys throw a lot of money at that part, didn't I? Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. Yeah. I kind of felt bad about that one. <laughs> yeah, okay. Sure you, sure you did. I remember that. That was a fun place. It was an old firehouse. Old firehouse. But like Crazy landlord. Else, we outgrew that, so yep. it's time to move on. What else was notable with you guys coming up? I mean, should we go into, like, trade show stories? We can, Well, before we go into trade show stories, the one time we did go up to Buffalo... We drove up in a, in a Cadillac. It was the only Cadillac I've ever oh been in. I had no goddamn heated seats. Jersey plates pulling up in a Cadillac at my place, my yeah, house. With no heated seats. Yeah. Because he, he bought a Florida car for, for Jersey weather. That was a cool car, though. It, we, we, you, were like, you were like 23 at the time. No. I we made it record. We, we did make it record time there, though. We did it was, a, it was like one. a five-hour drive. It was never too bad five going and a half. five and a half. It was always better going up early in the morning when nobody was on the road. What other good stories we got? The only, the only story I have is you weren't involved with is when I took Ryan to Harrisburg years ago and they thought I was his father because they weren't going to let him in the bar yeah. after hours. Like 18 years old. The guy goes, well, he can't come in unless you're his father. And I'm like, I'm not his father. He's like, oh, I thought you were his father. I'm like, well, is it going to get him in the bar? They're like, yeah. I go, well, then I'm his father. <laughs> come on in. Harrisburg was my first experience with you guys, and I instantly fell in love with those orange crushes. <laughs> those would mess you up. <laughs> I remember those. Oh, man. Remember whatever those place we would go to that was on the water there or whatever, that was that was awesome. Yeah, I remember those orange crushes. That was uh, You got orange crushed that night, I think. Yep. Yep. You were not feeling well the next morning. That was the first time. Uh, maybe it wasn't Harrisburg, but we came to PA for something. Oh, we were out in that cabin in the woods for oh, something. Oh, yeah, I remember that It was cabin. the first time Jen and I had breaded chicken wings. We didn't know what the hell it was. How's Kels? She's good. She wants to see you. Is she here? Yeah, she's at the. She's. At the is there like a special guest here right now? No, she's in the other office. She's in the other office. They're all paperwork. down there. It would have been awesome, like, like this is Maury Povich this is, coming in or something like that. This is. This is. Is she here right now? They call this corporate. They ask if we take the helicopter down to the other shop. I mean, this is cool, man. Yeah, this yeah. is really cool. He was show, they were showing me around. Um, I'm, I'm, take, I'm gonna take the whole third floor. I think make it just my office. Where's the airfield going in? Oh, uh, there's gonna be helicopters okay. on the roof. Okay, very so cool. They said we, we could do that. No, it's very impressive. I mean, you guys are growing too, so it's exciting to see. Maybe stressful. You should be proud of it. I am Everything's proud stressful. Of it. If there's nothing stressful in life, no, I know. You know, I, I get it. I understand. I understand 100 percent where you're where you're going with it. There's certain things that, as a as an owner, and, and Ryan and I have conversations about that you're like, you worry about, right? Like when you we're, so we're over 40 employees now. We're over 40 strong. We're almost 45 strong. And when you started, there was five. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and six, and you, and you were you you were two of them. You would, you were yeah. a partner. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, you know, now we're talking forty-five, uh, and we have to make sure that, you know, the the goal is to keep everybody working, keep everybody yeah, paid, absolutely. keep everybody. That's a huge stress, benefits, right? Benefits and everything else, and that's a that's a stressor that you know. You always worry about because yeah. you know, you don't you don't want to lose people, right? And you don't want to have to lay anybody off, sure. So you. If you don't grow, what's going to happen? Yeah, we, we, we myself and uh, Brandon Whitaker, who is, you know, he's on, on the team with me on the fire side, we just had the same conversation. Like, we're walking through the factory, we're meeting everybody, and, you know, not that we will ever see a line down, but, like, you want to have that motivation to keep those lines going and just make sure everybody's working and, you know, sustainable and all that stuff. So it's, it's the, our whole sales team feels that, you know? Right, and that's one of the things to say, like, you know, about – other companies that may have downsized during COVID or after it, and well, that, that's COVID. the thing for us. Like, I'll, I'll throw a plug at us. This is pretty impressive. Like, we broke ground on our third building expansion during COVID. We had no layoffs. We were hiring people. Um, I think we're at like 455 employees right now. Just the few years I've been there, I've been there six years. We've expanded twice, and every time I go back, I go back monthly or bi-monthly. There's always something changing there. 
you know, kind of like because they're in the, they're in a, they're in a grow mode. Yeah, we're, right. we're in the same. We're in the yeah, same. Exactly. We're, we're, we're smaller size right. overall, but we're in that grow mode. And the same thing, COVID. I don't think I, I think COVID. We had what 16, 17 employees when we first eighteen. We were we were under twenty. Yeah. Well, maybe twenty if we counted the Buffalo location. Right, we right, had right. Sixteen right. here, and I think four up there at the time. Right. And you know, we were splitting shifts, and we were doing all this stuff to try and keep us. And we came out of COVID. And we hired, what, in six months, we hired, like, 12 or 14 more people. Well, that's impressive you know, that's, because that's, my travels across the country, everybody's fighting for labor right now. Well, we are, too. You know, it's... We are, too. We're, we're, we're in the same boat as everybody yeah, else. We're it's, fighting for labor. It's it's sad to see because, you know, timelines are getting pushed back. And, you know, if you don't have labor, you can't get stuff out, right? We just had a meeting with... We, we just came from a meeting with somebody else, and that's, you know... That's their biggest issue. That's they, they're they're falling behind because they got a lot of large orders in. Yep. And now they're, he's like, "Listen, we're trying to catch up, but it's a it's a labor." Issue. That's the worst part of this industry right now. That's that's the most stressful part. I agree with you. You know, um, you know, we're pretty good on getting product out, but I I feel for the upfitters that can't build them fast enough, and the customer is like, "It's not my problem, right?" You know, when I when we started this venture, you can get a truck out in seven to twelve weeks. Those days are long gone. You know, with the fluctuating car market on when you're going to get vehicles that screws everything up and um it's just a different time and now it's like you know you tell them it's gonna be six to eight months and they're like okay whatever because that's how the market is now so that's just the market right well, a lot of yeah it, but it is though. we're all in the same boat yeah it, 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 that's what i guess what i was getting at you know nationwide every shop i go to everybody's in the same boat yeah i mean crap when i got in the fire department you can get a, a custom pumper in a year less than a year Long gone. Now it's three and a half to four years. Right. Long gone. Some people are waiting two and a half years for a pre-build, which is crazy. But it's good that everybody's busy, you know? Just to see what happens in the industry at some point. It's got to level off or something's going to happen. I mean, everybody's just getting busier. Nobody's going to be – if you don't have work right now, you're not – you're doing something wrong. (laughs) Not to sound like that, but – True. Everybody's busy. So, Gabe, thank you for uh, coming out and uh, spending a little bit of time with us and showing us how you've kind of broke your way into, you know, your new role or not your new role, but your right. your existing role and how you've kind of, you know, molded yourself into, you know, the higher level management of a, a major corporation that you have been. Yeah. And how, you know, your progress and your, your accomplishments at, and in that position and how you've grown that, yeah. you know, that department basically is, you know, a testament to yourself and you know, appreciate that. what you can put yourself to if you put your mind to it. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's, um, you know, again, you surround yourself with good people and positive people, good things happen, and getting with a great company. They gave me the tools and the leadership uh, training and education. You know, sound off, um, I, I, I want to continue to grow with them, and I plan to continue to grow with them, and um, – it's just best thing I ever did. No offense. <laughs> Is that to me or to Jen? Both. Both. Okay. Love you. <laughs> Babe. So thank you for checking out this week's episode of the 1075 Chatter Podcast. Be sure to check out all of our other episodes and tune in each week for uh, you know another episode.